Dr. Edwards Deming, the guy that helped revolutionize Japan in the 1940s, said a very simple thing. He said, you only know what you know until you learn something else. I'm a professor at Pittsburgh State University and I've been teaching for more than 30 years. And you would think that somebody that's been teaching that long has pretty well got everything figured out, how to do it just right. Well, I've often thought of the words of Dr. Denming and I've always pondered, am I doing the right thing? Am I good enough for my students? Am I helping them learn? And in that discovery, in that journey, I have found something remarkable that I think will change not only the way that I teach my students, but perhaps the way teachers all over the world will teach their students. That thing is called the latency effect. Let's talk a little bit about what the latency effect is. Now, most of you in this room know what latency is, or at least from your perspective. Latency for you is how long it takes to download that phone app before it starts working on your phone. That's called digital latency. Or from the time that you download an application on your computer and you can start playing the game or doing the operation. That's digital latency. Well, the same thing happens to each and every one of us in the classroom. It's called learning latency. Learning latency is from the time that the teacher teaches the lesson and then the student can do something with it, apply it, make it apply to the real world. Now, if you stop and think about it, here's what it is. Latency is the gap. From the time I deliver it and my expectation that you'll learn it until the reality of when you actually do use it. Now the question is, it's interesting that we have built this intentionally into our educational system. I don't care what classroom you go to in North America. If you go to a welding classroom, a technology classroom, even a biology or chemistry lab, what you find is here is a classroom with a PowerPoint and a blackboard or whiteboard and, and the cognitive learning theory. And then we have the lab, which is separated. And we go take what we've learned in theory and we apply it in the lab. Everybody knows that's how you do it. That's how we do it across schools, apprenticeship programs all over the country. And we've done that for hundreds of years. We know that's what we're supposed to do. We teach it and we have them do it. Well, here's the thing. Is latency something that should happen? If you go onto any site and you Google it real quick, you'll see that they say latency is an expected thing. For example, you learned the Pythagorean theorem in algebra. Some of you are still trying to figure out what that one's all about. Or you learned a theory in science class and it really hasn't hit home yet, but someday it will. It's expected that's what will happen. Well, as Dr. Edward Stemming says, you only know what you know until you learn something different. So I've asked the question, why? Why do we expect that? Is that just a natural phenomena or is it perhaps more to do with the way I teach and not so much about how they learn. So I've done a little bit of looking into that. And I have discovered, ladies and gentlemen, the answer is an emphatic no. Latency is not to be expected unless you're boring and dry and expect your students not to get it because that's what will happen if you're not engaging. But if I change the way I teach, if I change the methodology, I can inspire everybody in the room and I can help them get it right the first time. Not just a few, but everybody. Think about if we could change a classroom and not just a few, not, not as we'll hear another speaker talk about the butterflies and the caterpillars, but everybody gets it all at the same time. So let's think, let's think about that. 
we're going to get rid of the latency gap. Just take that gap out of the middle, and we're going to teach it. We're going to have them apply it. We're going to do it simultaneously. And guess what? Learning is going to go up. Retention will go up. Initial learning scores will go up. And I can spend more time advancing education instead of repeating it. So, here's what's happened. In the last couple of years, I've had a unique opportunity. I've been called upon by the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage and Motion Picture Employees to travel all over North America. They've sent me to 12 different cities, and I've had more than 300 of their best apprenticeship trainers all over Canada and the United States come to my classrooms and workshops, and we've talked about this latency thing. We've talked about being the best teacher we can be so that when somebody comes on the job to learn the job, they learn it the first time and they can advance their skills so much quicker. And they've bought into this because I'm year, into year two of the contract and they've just talked about year three, so it must be working. But rather than tell you about it, I'm going to have you show me because I'm a participative instructor. I believe that when I teach, you must be engaged. And so each of you have been given three sheets of paper. What I have done in my training models with the entertainment industry is I've used three simple methods to make my point. And so the first method involves telling you and giving you instructions step by step. That sounds pretty simple, right? Everybody pull out your gold sheet of paper for me, if you will, and hold it up in front of you so that it looks like a diamond. I'm going to give you six simple steps. Do not interrupt me. Do not ask me questions. Just do as I say, and you should have what I have you do when I get through. Take the right corner and fold it over to the left corner and crease down the center. Do this as I tell you, please. Now, if you take that and open that up and take the right corner and fold it along the center crease. And do the same thing with the other corner and fold it along the center crease. Now take the bottom and fold it up. And take the bottom and fold it up one more time. About a half an inch this time. Okay, if you will, everybody in the room, hold up what you have just folded, what you have just made. Okay, I want you to give it up for these two young people right here in the gray sweater and the young man in the shirt beside her. They have sailboats, actually the three of you. Hold that up high. Now, here's my question. I gave you six simple directions. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I only had three of you in the entire room get it right. Why is that so? Tell me, why is that so? Well, I'll tell you why most of you. Well, you'll start to blame me. Well, it's your fault. You went too fast. You didn't let us ask questions. You didn't show us what to do. You sped right through it. There was no way I could keep up. And this poor guy on the front row is still folding it in half. He didn't know what's going on. Why is that? Well, perhaps it wasn't the learner. Maybe it was the instructor. You know, one thing that we've learned over the years is that I should show you what I'm talking about instead of just tell you. So let me show you the next one, and then you can show me. So don't pull out the paper yet. I'm just going to show you, and then you can show me. Ready? <clears throat> Pay attention, because you're going to show me in just a minute. I'm going to make a paper airplane. You're going to fold it in half lengthways. You're going to take the right top corner and fold it along the center crease. Then you're going to take the left corner and fold it along the center crease. Then you're going to fold it up like this. Now you're going to take the left half and you're going to fold it down so that it folds along the bottom side of the airplane. And you're going to do that one more time. Real quick, you're going to do that one more time, just like so. Now you're going to turn it around, you're going to do it to the other side. Same thing, real simple, you're going to fold it down to the bottom, 
Wind it up. Then you're going to do it one more time. Six simple folds. And you get what's called a dart, or as they call in Canada, an arrow. It's one of the farthest flying airplanes you can make. So now I've shown you, you show me. Go ahead, make me an airplane. The same way I just showed you. Now as you're making that, I want you to note something. You know, we only had three people before. Uh, three people, that's pretty small percentage. Guess what happened in the hundreds of people I've done this training for? Guess what the average is on making that sailboat ride? We find out that less than 10% in any given. I did it in front of a group of 350 executives in Palm Springs, and one person got it right. So you ought to feel good. You're batting better than average. As I look out there already, I can see that some of you are way off. Some of you aren't even close. Hold the point up so I can see where you're at. Some of you got it right. Some of you got it inside out because the folds are supposed to be underneath, not on top. It's not supposed to be a square plane. It's supposed to be a dart like the one next to you. So here again, I showed you what you were supposed to do, and you should have got it. But unfortunately, less than half of you in the room get it, and guess what? On average, when I do this method... Less than half of the students get it. You ask any teacher in America, when you teach a lesson, how many of your students get it right the first time? And most of them will tell you, eh, about half. And they expect that. Ladies and gentlemen, don't expect it. We can do better. Pull out your blue sheets of paper. I'm going to do it again. We're going to show you something. And we'll see if I can do a little bit better this time. Are you ready? Hold that sheet of paper up so that it looks like a diamond. Take that right corner and fold it over to the left corner and crease it down the center. As you do that, please hold it up so that everybody can see what you got. Hold it up like this. Okay? Now what I want you to do is I want you to take the right corner and fold it over to the left corner just like this. As you do so, make sure that it is straight across and even with the bottom. Make sure it's not dog-eared up or drooping down. And if you would, neighbors, look at your neighbors to make sure it's straight across and not droopy or dog-eared, and make sure you're with me. Okay? Now what I want you to do is I want you to take the left corner and do the same thing. It's going to come all the way over to this corner right here. It's going to come right over like that. Hold it up so that I can see. Again, neighbors, check your neighbors to make sure that it looks just like this. Everybody hold it up. Show me what you got. Excellent. Now at the top, you have two flaps at the very top. I want you to take the closest flap to the closest edge and pull it down over the folded side. And fold. Now turn it around so that you have the flat side and pull it down over the flat side. should have flaps on both sides. Now, everybody, if you will, take the wide part of it and stick your finger in the top, and you have a paper cup. So the next time that you go to a cocktail party and they say, sorry, we ran out of cups, you can bring your own and make your own because it works every time. So here's my question for you. The first time, I gave you six simple directions and only three people got it. The second time, I gave you six simple directions. I even showed you, and only half of you got it. But this time, I gave you six simple steps, and everybody in the room got it. Even the guy on the front row that was barely at the first step the first time. So how'd that happen? What did I do differently? Well, I'll tell you what I did differently. There were three key things. Okay? And this happens every time. Every time I do this... Every time, everybody in the room gets it right the first time. You go talk to a teacher and see how many of their students get it right the first time, every time. There's three keys that I did. Key number one, you got to see. you got to model behavior. Now, did you notice something funny when we were on the sailboat and the gold paper? And I got to stage two and I said, 
Okay, fold along the center line. Did you notice what everybody in the room was doing? You weren't watching me. You were looking at each other. And nobody in the room knew how to make it, except me. Lesson learned. Students always look for a model. And if you don't give them one, they go look it. And they may find it, even though it's not the one you want. Model what you want them to know. Step number two, you got to check for understanding. First time, I didn't ask questions. Second time, I didn't ask questions. Well, this time, notice after every step, I had you hold it up so I could see. I had your partner check it, so to make sure you were with us. We had model, check, and then correct. There were a few of you that were grouped. I saw your neighbor saying, hey, that's not quite right. Here, let's fix it. We corrected it before we moved on. But the point is, when I got to step six, everybody in the room had it right the first time. Could you imagine going on a field trip, and the teacher said, everybody get on the bus. So we get on the bus, and we go to the field trip, and when we get to where we're going, the teacher looks around and says, wait a minute, they're not here. Where'd they all go? Some got off at the last pit stop. Some got off at McDonald's. Some didn't even get on the bus. But because I didn't check until the end of the lesson, I've got to go all the way back and pick them up wherever they are. That happens in the classroom. If I don't check for understanding throughout the lesson, I'm going to leave somebody behind. i got to get them and bring them with me all the way through. Can you imagine the possibilities if we did change the way we teach? See, I have a simple message for you. You may have thought, what does this old teacher have to teach me? Always ask the question, why? Never settle for what's expected. See, I've been teaching for 30 years, and I've been told we do it this way. And I've always asked, why? That's not good enough. So always ask why. That's why I've titled this presentation, Generation Why. You can make a difference. You can make a difference when you're young or when you're old. But that journey matters about you asking the right questions. And always remembering, you only know what you know until you learn something else. Thank you.